Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part two of CT evaluation of vasculitis. Remember last time we spoke about large vessel disease and a little bit about small vessel disease. We spoke about Kawasaki's disease. And now the other big category is polyarteritis nodosa, or PAN. It's a necrotizing vasculitis of medium and small arteries with glomerulonephritis, and is unassociated with ANCA. It affects men twice as often as women, and it's in the fifth to seventh decade, so a little bit older than some of the other processes. Its etiology is unclear, but the hep B virus may play an important role. Renal involvement is very common, so a vasculitis that involves the kidney. I showed you before Takayashu's with the renal arteries, but really renal involvement is polyarthritis nodosa in 80% of cases. It can result in proteinuria, hematuria, hypertension, and hypertension. Now, polyarthritis nodosa, patients often present with systematic or systemic disease. Uh, they can pre present where you might be thinking about neoplasm or some process of unknown etiology. And if you don't think about it, the diagnosis will come late. It's really the excellent clinician who thinks about vasculitis. It's more frequently in middle-aged men. Most common clinical symptoms are persistent fever, weight loss, and polyarthralgias. You can see why you'd be thinking about malignancy. The hallmark is aneurysmal formation of small and medium-sized arteries, particularly in the kidney. Now, um, one of the things about these aneurysms is they may be multiple, and they're typically multiple but not just two or three, but we're talking 20 or 30. It can indeed be very impressive, particularly in the kidneys. It can lead to infarction. It can lead to indistinct cortical medullary differentiation. Now, here was a case initially where no one knew exactly what was going on. You see all these bright areas in the kidneys. I don't know if they thought those were calyces or partially stones. There was some scarring in the left kidney, perhaps. But and you can see on the delayed phase, it looks like just there's a little bit of um, asymmetric function in the kidneys left to right, scarring in the left kidney, less scarring in the right kidney. But instead of looking at the images as we did the last two images, you go from this image and you simply flip it into MIP. Now you recognize TNTC, two numerous to count aneurysms in both kidneys off the renal arteries. That's going to be polyarthritis nodosa, just looking at those images. And then you see the spleen. There are multiple splenic artery aneurysms. And then you follow it down. Here's with, with uh, cinematic rendering. And in addition to the kidney and splenic arteries, there are arteries and their aneurysms. There are aneurysms off the patient's SMA and its branches. Again, I do like MIP imaging, a slab of about 10 millimeters to look for tiny aneurysms. You can see in this patient, the aneurysms are typically one to five millimeters. So they're indeed very, very small and very easy to miss. You can see this small aneurysms coming off branches off the SMA there and here as well. So now we're talking about multiple vascular territories which are involved. Again, the closer you look at the mesenteric vessels, the more aneurysms you're seeing on the right side, on the left side, and the jejunal branches and ileal branches as well. Again, just a very nice look at a very impressive case of polyarthritis nodosa. And again, look at the size of the splenic artery aneurysms, which are one to two millimeters in size. Here's another patient with polyarthritis nodosa, had prior embolization, also has a dissection of the aorta. But look at the branches of the SMA. You see the irregularity of those branches, multiple areas of beating. If I see large vessels, you know, like the SMA, I guess we'd consider that a medium-sized vessel. But when I see the smaller branches off the SMA having all of these tiny aneurysms, I'm thinking about polyarthritis nodosa, PAN. The same thing with the changes in the kidney. And typically, you're going to have changes in the kidney and the renal arteries as well as in the mesenteric vessels. So you can see that very nicely here. And again, the harder you look, the more images you reconstruct, the easier it is to see the beating. Again, in this patient, you can see why arterial phase imaging is so critical for early detection of small aneurysms. And again, here's just some more views showing you that as well.
And again, the extent of disease, particularly well shown on MIP imaging, as well as on volume rendering. So again, multiple small aneurysms, renal arteries, mesenteric vessels, you gotta be thinking polyuretis nodosa. Here's another example with abdominal pain. Look at the patient's branches of the SMA. I'll show you two cases. Here you see multiple small aneurysms off the SMA branches, particularly the jejunal branches, but also off the ileal branches, nicely seen. And here it is with the MIP imaging as well. Look at all of these little tiny two millimeter artery aneurysms that are so easy to see. Another example, again, branches off the SMA, nicely shown with multiple small aneurysms and beating present. Again, thin slabs are very important, whether you're doing volume rendering or MIP imaging, if you wanna see all of the uh, small aneurysms. Then of course, volume rendering and NPR can be most helpful when looking at the organs themselves, looking at the end organ involvement. And again, just a few more views. Now we spoke about large and medium, and that means we need to speak about small vessel vasculitis. Again, these are divided into two big categories, ANCA, ANCA associated small vessel vasculitis, and immune complex associated small vessel vasculitis. Here's a nice example of IgG4 vasculitis. Look at the patient's celiac and the hepatic and splenic arteries. They're both in case, particularly the hepatic artery. Look how small the caliber is, even on MIP imaging. It's nearly occluded, but look at all that soft tissue thickening surrounding the vessel. So it's not just like atherosclerotic change with plaque. This is soft tissue infiltration around the vessel, causing narrowing of the lumen. That's vasculitis. You see it very nicely here. You see the common hepatic artery. You see both the right and left hepatic arteries as well. Just a very nice uh, infiltration around the vessels with narrowing of the vessels. Now there are mimickers of vasculitis, things that we see that involve vessels, but are in a different category. And three of them that I'll just at least comment on, fibromuscular dysplasia, FMD, which we see a lot of in practice, segmental arterial mediolysis, which we don't see all that frequently, and neurofibromatosis, which again is fairly infrequent. FMD causes less than 10% of renal artery stenosis, but we often will evaluate patients with hypertension, young or middle-aged women, associations with FMD, smoking, hormonal use, and vasovasorum disorders. In symptomatic patients, lesions are bilateral in about 71% of cases. FMD is a vascular disease that can result in stenosis, the section or aneurysms of nearly all arterial distributions. Areas most commonly involve renal, extracranial carotid, and vertebral arteries. So you need to look anywhere from the base of the skull down through the pelvis when you're looking and suspecting FMD because not every area is involved, but you need to look at all the vessels to be certain. Clinical presentation is of course driven by the vascular beds involved. So whether it's hypertension or carotid artery involvement leading to tinnitus or it's headache or TIAs, it's all gonna depend what vessels are involved and to what extent. One of the things to remember in the renal arteries, we always look for beating of the renal arteries. That's the classic, but you also can see stenosis. You also can see aneurysm formation. So again, it's things you wanna look at. We always look for that um, beating type appearance, which shows particularly well on the MIP imaging, and it's easy to miss if you're not careful on the axial. So three things we'll look at in the kidney. Here's a great example of FMD involving both renal arteries, but especially that right renal artery with the beating nicely seen, okay? Classic FMD. Here's FMD with this involvement of the splenic and renal. There's a small splenic artery aneurysm right there and there. And then you track downward and you can see there's an aneurysm in the patient's uh, right renal artery. And I don't know why my thing keeps jumping, but it keeps wanting to have a mind of its own, so I won't touch it, but there it is, that right renal artery aneurysm. You see the multiple splenic, re splenic artery aneurysms and actually a second right renal artery aneurysm as well. So very important to be able to recognize that. Here's a good example of where there's FMD with involvement of the renal arteries, but also look at the impressive beating of the external iliac arteries bilaterally as well. So you wanna look at each of the vessels 
As I mentioned, at times it's hard to see these findings on axial imaging. 3D imaging, even the simplest MIP imaging, as in this case, can be very valuable. Another example here with this obvious beating in the patient's right renal artery. And then when you look carefully, there's also beating in the SMA. So again, multiple vessel involvement is one of the hallmarks of fibromuscular dysplasia. Just important to remember. And we do see a lot of it. And here's a patient with multiple SMA aneurysms or for SMA branch in a patient with fibromuscular dysplasia, nicely shown either on the volume rendering or in the MIP imaging or in the cinematic rendering. So on all of these, you indeed can see it very, very nicely. Now, another entity that we are seeing a reasonable number of cases is Ernheim-Chester disease. And Ernheim-Chester disease gives you this thickening of the aorta, which looks like a large vessel vasculitis, also can look very much like intramural hematoma. One of the things that helps, it's very extensive often, but that you do have involvement of the areas around the kidney. So here we see the thoracic aorta, the abdominal aorta, the celiac, the SMA. You can see these patients will often, if you do PET, will have increased activity. And one of the ways of monitoring response is to look at the PET activity and see how it drops off with therapy. But very nice example of the activity, particularly in the arch, but also in the ascending and descending thoracic aorta. Here's another example, chest pain. Look at the extent. At first you say, well, could this be intramural bleeding? Could this be bleeding around the great vessels? Then you realize it's homogeneous soft tissue around the arch and branch vessels off the arch. You see it very nicely on the sagittal 3D view as well. You're going to see it extends down into the abdominal aorta. And then you have all of the soft tissue thickening around the kidneys. It's around the mesentery and the aorta and the abdomen, but it's really around the kidneys in the perirenal space. When we see disease in the perirenal space, we also talk about things like lymphoma. There are strange things like extramedullary hematopoiesis, trauma with bleeding, I mentioned lymphoma. But when you have this soft tissue thickening or bilateral, there's no displacement of the aorta, maybe there's some thickening of the aorta, and then you have the extensive thoracic disease, that's ernheim chester disease. Perirenal soft tissue thickening, the first thing that comes out of my mouth now in a patient who doesn't have a history of malignancy is ernheim chester disease. And this was a good article talking about its arch involvement and the perinephric involvement. Here they say perinephric fibrosis. It's more like an inflammatory process of a really fills in that peri and pararenal space very nicely. So we've looked at vasculitis. We've looked at this process of non-infectious inflammation of the blood vessels. We looked at trying to divide them up into categories, which makes it easier for us to remember large, medium, and small. We looked at some of the entities, including ernheim chester fibromuscular dysplasia, all things that are vasculitis. And vasculitis seems to be one of the things that's increasing with frequency. Again, the radiologist, it's important. You know how to evaluate the cases, know how to do the protocols, know the importance of 3D imaging. But even if the patient is simply referred with FUO, rule out malignancy, make sure you're looking carefully. Look at the vessels because every once in a while, we're going to come up with the answer of vasculitis when the clinician is not even thinking about it. So we are playing a major role. Again, getting familiar with the features. You saw a bunch of cases here. You can go to the website, CTSS. There's a lot more cases there. There's a number of good references for articles that are worthwhile reading, so you really can improve your understanding. And with that, I thank everybody for their attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.